Hallelujah. Can I hear amen? Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah is a universal language. It's for you. Every tongue speaks it. So is amen. Um, we'll still continue with uh, the book of Ephesians. I sent you what we're looking at today. I sent you on Friday or Saturday, I think so, early in the morning, around 4 a.m. I will share with you today, made acceptable in the beloved. It is only in Christ that we are made acceptable. Outside of Christ, no one is acceptable in the sight of the Holy God. Hallelujah. No one is pleasing to him enough to stand before him. No one is qualified. It is only in the beloved. If you are in the beloved, if you are in Christ, you are acceptable. Hallelujah. Um, like I said before, this book, the book of Ephesians, I thank God for this book. It's an amazing book. Uh, if we hold on to these words in Ephesians, we will be firmly grounded in the Lord and in his kingdom, and we will be useful in his hands. And so we'll read, it's a very short passage, um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, verses 5 to 6. And then he says, Having predestined us to adoptions as sons by Christ Jesus to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us acceptable in the beloved. Hallelujah. He predestined us that we may be adopted by Christ Jesus according to his will and his pleasure, that we may be acceptable in the beloved. That we may be acceptable in the beloved. Um, Story will go to the point predestined to sonship by Christ. I know this topic is a very hot debated topic, predestination mm. and election. It's a fight topic. Uh, even in the seminary, uh, among the theologians, it's a, it's a big fight. But I don't see any fight there. I think it's really unnecessary mm. that we should fight over these things. Uh, I started working on this topic right after last Sunday's message. And I, as I was working on it, I, it got to a point I had to stop and just pray, say, God, how do I handle this? It's a very delicate topic. Uh, the church divided into two over this topic. What do I say? How do I do it? So I just left the whole thing and just pray, God, grant me wisdom. And then I think after three or four days, I went back to it. Um, I did some reading, some research, and I'm praying. And I got satisfied in my heart then. I said, oh God, yes, I got it. I got the answer now. So I went back to it uh, and continued working on it until I finished on Friday, uh, Saturday around 4 a.m. Um, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, we are predestined. What does it mean? It means God has marked us ahead of time, beforehand. Um, and from this word, we also get the word horizon, you know, on the horizon, far away. And he sees us. So God sees, he, you know, he saw us in the eternity past. And who are these us? What does he mean, us? We, who? Uh, he saw us, who? We will see these things in the scriptures. Um, it is only in Christ that we can become sons of God because he uh, is the one who will make us qualified. When you read verse 5, it says, Have he predestined us to be uh, to adoption as sons by Christ to himself? So there's no way anyone can become a child of God or a son of God or a daughter of God on his or her own merit. It is only through the Son, Jesus Christ. Unless you are regenerated as a son in Christ, God cannot be your father. And so, 
God, in his own wisdom, decided that it's it, it in Christ Jesus that he will become our father. Then we can be his sons and daughters. And he did that in eternity past. As in himself, before the beginning of anything, in himself. We can't even imagine it. It's far beyond. It's inexhaustible. We, uh, we, we can't completely know it. <laughs> uh, so... Um, and I want us to understand one thing that we can only receive what Christ has attained. You know, whatever we are today, it's not because we have attained it on our own. It's not because we have achieved it out of our own try and error, effort, or you know, anything. It is just because Christ has done it and gave it to us. And so that if you believe and you accept by faith what he has accomplished, you become qualified. So there's no way we can have anything, we can receive anything, unless Christ first attain it, accomplish it for us, and deliver it to us, and we receive it by faith. Amen. Mm -hmm. Unless Christ attain it first. Because for all have seen and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, there's none that does justice in the earth. Not even one. That's why the strong arm of the Lord, his own right hand, delivered us. And so when you read Acts chapter 13, verses 33, it says, God has fulfilled these for us. Their children. In that he has raised up Jesus, as it is written also in the second psalm, You are my son, today have I begotten you. So Peter was speaking here. I said, Jesus has fulfilled what God has promised to the fathers. Jesus has fulfilled it. But better still, God has fulfilled it, yes, by raising Christ from the dead. By Christ's resurrection from the dead, there's an open door for you and for me to become sons and daughters of God. If we believe the work he accomplished on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, then we become sons and daughters of God. That's what scripture is saying here. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, the, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the children of the what? The patriot. So God has fulfilled this promise because God said, in you shall all the seeds of the earth, or the family of the earth, be blessed in your seed shall all the family of the earth be blessed. Through him, he will raise for himself a people more than we can count, more than the stars of the heavens and more than the, the sun, the sands by the seashore. That's what scripture says. And Bible is saying that God has fulfilled this by raising up Christ. And then God made a, 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 a very good statement here through the psalmist. He said, you are my son. Today have I begotten you. Jesus is a begotten son of God. What does it mean? It doesn't mean he was given back to. Or it doesn't mean there was a time that he wasn't there. And then at a point he came into being or the father gave it to him. No, not that. Jesus is 100% God, completely God in himself. He has life in himself. He has power to lay down his life and to take it back. He is God and God alone. Amen. Now, when God says, the Father says, today have I begotten you, what does he mean? He's speaking about his resurrection from the dead. In fact, his incarnation and his resurrection from the dead. The dead. 
That's, that's, that's what God is speaking through the psalmist here to us. So it's a prophecy concerning the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. Say, so you are my son. Today have I begotten you. So the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, when he was born, suffered, died, buried. When he resurrected, the Father endorsed him openly, said, you are my son, today have I begotten you. An open declaration to public, to everyone, so that since he has now been born, he is begotten raised from the dead as a son and declared to the world, anyone who believes in him becomes a son. Because by that, Christ has attained the sonship of the Father. Then because he has attained it, we can also receive it now by faith. If Christ has never been a son, we would never have had a chance to be sons of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Can I hear amen? amen? So there's nothing that we can receive except Christ accomplish it first. Thank God that Christ did it for us. Thank God. And this also in the past. Among the patristics, I mean early fathers of the faith, they really fought over this topic. There was a great division or so. Some believe that oh, it means that the son at one point was, was non-existent. And then at one point he became. So uh, he saw the son is not God in the sense that the father is. But that's misunderstand. That's to misunderstand scripture. Now when God, when Bible speaks about you are my son today, have I begotten you? It's not speaking about the eternal existence of Christ. No, he's talking about his resurrection from the dead as the firstborn. That's what scripture says. Scripture says. He's the firstborn because he rose from the dead first. And so unless Christ has done it, we cannot. And thank God he has done it. And now that he has done it and he has been declared son, we can also now be declared sons if we believe in him. Hallelujah. And as long as you will believe in him, you are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. Hallelujah. Christ has done it for us. And I believe that um, as we are here this afternoon, it's because we believe in what he has done for us. May you walk in that authority and power of sonship. There is an authority that comes with it. There's power that comes with it. As a son of God, as a child of God, as a daughter of God. The Bible says that as many as believe in him, to them he gives power to become the sons of God. There is an authority that comes with it. The enemy cannot touch your life. Your life is sealed with the accomplished work of Christ on the cross. All we have to do is to receive it. <coughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. And Romans 8 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. See? So, nobody ever heard about God having a son. They said, Father, Son, Spirit. No, no one ever heard about this. There wasn't anything like this kind of theology until Christ came in. And why is it so? So that when he has finished accomplishing everything concerning the sonship, then we, fallen women, sinners, dead in sin, if we believe in him, we can resurrect. We can receive a new life. We can also become sons and daughters by the grace of God, as we have faith in his work. God's intention is that all of us, those who believe in him, will be conformed 
to the image of his son, who will be like Jesus. That's why he calls the sons also conforming to Jesus, the son of the living God. Jesus said, who do men say that I am? I am. And then he said, oh, this one said, you are like this, you are that, you are that, you are that. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Elijah. Then he said, but you, who do you say that I am? And then Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. <laughs> and then Jesus was, Jesus was excited. And he said, Peter, I tell you, not flesh and blood has revealed this to you, but it is my Father who is in heaven. And I tell the truth, upon this revelation that you have given of me, that I am the Christ, that's the rock, I will build my church, and the gate of hell will not prevail against it. So Jesus is the Son of God first to open the door for many to become sons and daughters of God, if they will believe in him. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus said, believe God and believe me also. That's what he said. If we believe him, he gives us the power to become sons of God. I thank God for Christ, for what he has done for us. I'll come back to this issue of predestination and explain it and then and talk a little bit about the division that is within a church because of that and why it is not necessary and we don't have to fight over it. The most important thing is to believe in Christ Jesus. That he is your Lord and he is your savior. There's no need for theological fight. It's not necessary. Um, I say that before my professors in class, say before my, my colleagues, there's no need to fight over any theological issues. As far as salvation is concerned, Christ has done the work for us. What is required is faith in what he has done and not someone's theology. And that we begin to split ourselves among them. We will see more about that. Paul rebuked us about that, said, don't do that. Paul didn't die for you. Apollos didn't die for you. It was Christ who died for you. And if Christ died for you, why do you now split yourself among Paul and Apollos and Peter? It's not necessary. I believe it's not necessary. What is important is to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He offered up himself for you. He laid down his life so that you and me, as we believe in him, we become sons of God. Because God has already declared it, planned it, that whoever will believe in him will be conformed to the image of him, Christ. Amen. In John 3, 27, verse 30, I mean to 30, John, I mean Christ is, um, uh, John is speaking right here. John answered and said, um, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourself bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. And he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But a friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase that I must decrease. This is the declaration of John the Baptist who came as a forerunner preparing the way, the way of the Lord. And he said, a man can receive nothing. You cannot receive anything unless God, first of all, gave it to you. We cannot receive it. We can't, we can't go into the sonship of God. We cannot enter into it. We cannot be counted sons and daughters unless we receive it from Christ, unless Christ give it to us, unless he first accomplish it and then give it to us. Then we can receive it. Hallelujah. That's why Christ came down from heaven to the earth to accomplish this grand work that no one was able to do and no one will ever be able to do apart from him. And he came to accomplish it willingly. The 
though it was painful, it was difficult. He did it willingly so that we can receive sonship. We can receive it. We can receive, we can become sons of God and daughters of God. And he, Christ, must increase in us today. We must learn to walk with him more and more. And Romans 8.32 says, uh, um, He who did not spare his own son. So, in the New Testament, we see a lot of God speaking about son, son, his son. But until then, we, we heard nothing about it. Uh, at the advent of Christ, his first coming, uh, we see him as the son of God so that he can make, you know, raise many sons like unto himself, unto the Father. Um, we thank God for, for Christ. He said, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. For us all. What does it mean? As many as who believe. All the believers. God delivered up his own son for us all. Bible is not saying for some. He said for us all. For as many as who have faith in him. As many as who have faith in him. As we have already seen in John uh, chapter 1. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But as many as. And here it's saying that God gave up his own son for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things, including becoming sons and daughters of God? If God has gave up his son, the only begotten son, now the question to us is, why do you doubt that God can freely give you everything else? That is giving you and making you a son and a daughter. Amen. So in Christ, we attain sonship. We become sons and daughters. It is only in him because he has accomplished it. God gave him up for us. All that is required of us is that we do not harden our heart when we hear the word of God, as Hebrew says. So do not harden your heart today as you hear the word of God. We, we have to believe him. And we must share this truth with others, with our family members first, because they are the closest. And then to our friends. And then to our colleagues at workplaces and schools. And then to people around, if possible, if possible, on the street. Share with people. There's no other truth that can liberate than this. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This releases and sets us free. Let's share this with people and set them free. John chapter 1, verse 16 to 18 says, And of his fullness... Of whose fullness? Of Christ, of course. Of his fullness, we all received grace for grace. Of his fullness, of him being son, we have also received sonship. Amen. Of Christ being the son, we have now received sonship. We become sons and daughters of his fullness. Unless he is first, we cannot be. But if he has gone ahead of us to be, then he has opened the way for us to enter. Hallelujah. That because there's no good in us. There's nothing good in us. We can never please God on our own. We can never become sons of God. When God looks at us, we are very, 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 very appalling to his sight. Unless he sees us through the work that his son has done in us. Christ Jesus. 
and then his anger and justice. The just demand of his righteousness and holiness is appeased, satisfied when he sees that through Christ we can only become sons because Christ is a son. He has achieved it for us that we should receive it. So of his fullness, we have received grace for grace. The Bible says we will be conformed to his image. So he has the image first, and then we conform to it. He is the son first, then we become sons. He must go before us. He must go before us. And he has gone ahead of us. And we have received. Say, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So he has declared the Father, Father to all of us. The Hebrews, they never at any time refer to God as Father. It has never happened. They will not even mention the name of God. So instead of mentioning his name, they will prefer just to bow like this. So when you see a Hebrew doing this, he is mentioning the name of God. He's just too holy. He will not open his mouth. So he will prefer to do this. But Jesus came, and not only calling him, you know, Father, but he said, He is your Father also. So Christ came, opened the door. He came as Son of God, opened the door for all of us to enter through him and to call the Father, Father. So when the disciples, I mean, wanted to know how to pray, and they asked him, Teacher, would you teach us how to pray? He said, when you pray, say, our Father. It's an amazing statement to make. That from human mouth, these expressions will come out. Our Father, my Father. The Hebrews don't, up to date, they don't agree with Christians on this issue. He said, God cannot be your Father. But Jesus says he is our father. He has declared him to us. He said no one has ever seen the father. Not at any time, no. Except the only begotten who is in the bosom of the father. He has declared him to us. To us all who believe in him. So in him who is a beloved of the father, in him we are accepted as sons and daughters. Not outside of him. Not outside of Christ, in Him, in Christ, in Christ alone. There's a beautiful song like that. In Christ alone, it's a beautiful song. In Him alone, in Him we stand as sons and daughters of God, washed and cleansed by His blood, established by the truth He has brought us, liberated us with the truth. As working days, celebrating the Lord. And then in John 20, 17, Jesus again said something about that. He said, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. That was when he resurrected from the dead. Early Sunday morning, when many were, Mary, Mary went to the tomb to go and check whether he was still alive. When she got there, the Lord has risen. Uh, she saw her, she was excited. And she was about to have the Lord hold on to him. Then the Lord said, no, don't cling on to me yet. For I have not shown myself to the Father. What does that mean? <laughs> Christ must first be declared son from death by the father before anyone can cling unto him. 
So he said, wait. Let me ascend to my father first. And upon his validation, you can now cling on to me. And thank God we have already seen it in Psalm. I mean, we read it in Romans, but Romans was, was quoting, Paul was quoting from Psalm 2. He said, today you are my son. He said, you are my son, today have I begotten you. That's about Christ rising from the dead. So he ascended to the Father. Then the Father said, today have I begotten you. Hallelujah. That's why he told Mary, don't cling on to me yet. Don't cling unto me yet. Unless Christ first become, we cannot cling unto anything. He must give it to us before we can hold on to it. He must give it to us. Hallelujah. It is only in him that we are accepted. If he is not declared, We cannot be declared either by anyone. But since the Father declared him son, then in him, when we believe in him, the Father sees us as sons also, fulfilling the promise he made to Abraham, as I've already quoted, that out of your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed, all the families. Not some families, no. Not some families. Family, all the families of the earth. As many as who believe, as many as who have faith in the salvific work of Christ on the cross, we thank God for Jesus. We bless his name. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the, is the first begotten from the dead. So when the Bible is speaking about you are my son, today have I begotten you, it's not speaking about Christ's eternal nature. No, not about his eternal nature. Eternally, he is God. But when God says, today have I begotten you, he's speaking to, you know, to Christ about his human nature because Christ is also a human being, 100%, just as he's God 100%. So when God says, today have I begotten you, it's about his human nature. Having dominion over death, rising from the dead, as a seed that was sown to death, rising to life, that many might come out of him. So when we read Revelation chapter 1 verse 5, can someone read for us? I don't have it here. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And then another person also open to Colossians chapter 1, verse 8. Colossians 1, 8. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5? Yes. Okay. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the mm -hmm. firstborn from the dead. Wait a minute. He is what? The faithful witness. He is the firstborn from the dead. Please continue. And the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. So he is a faithful, I mean, he's a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. So when the Bible speaks of Christ being a son of God, begotten today, have, today have I begotten you, it's talking about his resurrection from the dead. The Jehovah Witnesses would say, based on this, uh, based on the fact that the Bible says Jesus Christ the Son, then he's, uh, uh, he's a subordinate of the Father. That's really wrong. He's not. He's God all alone. He's God by himself. He has life in himself just like the Father. And he said it also. Because he came as a human being, so that he would transform those who believe in him, he became son. That's it. So that we can also become sons. 
So as he rose from the dead with a human body, I mean, yeah, with a, rising from the dead with a human body, we can also have hope of resurrection. Because if he never rose from the dead, no man will have hope of resurrection. End of story. But he rose first so that we can have hope and we will rise second. Uh, Colossians 1.18. Somebody read for us. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. Yes, go ahead. And he is the head of the body, mm -hmm. church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. He is the head of the body. He is the firstborn from the dead among many. Many what? Many sons. That's what it means. Many sons and daughters. So unless he becomes son first, we cannot become sons and daughters. So he is the first son, first brother, among many brothers. He is the first one from the dead. So as he has risen from the dead, we have hope of coming out of the dead. Praise the Lord. Can I hear amen? Amen. We have hope. In him, we are accepted. He is a beloved. Now, the reason for our, our adoption, why will God adopt us his sons? Why? We want us to look at something over there. It is according to the pleasure, the good will, the good pleasure of God himself for his own glory. And some will say, ah, then, God is full of himself. Yes, he is full of himself. He is God all alone. He is complete in himself. So whatever he does, it, it's for his pleasure. It is for his pleasure. Not for anyone. But of course, he does it out of love also. His will and his pleasure. It is by God's will that we live. In him we live and move and have our being. Second Corinthians 6, 72 to 80 says, Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, you see? And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. You can find this in Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Second Samuel. This is the word of God. This is a prophecy that God gave in Isaiah, gave it in Ezekiel, and also in 2 Samuel. That we will be his sons. We will be his daughters. But he will only do that through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. He must first attain it, achieve it. Then we can receive it by faith. If we believe in his work. Hallelujah. Ezekiel 18, 23 says, I do not have any pleasure at all. That's God speaking through the mouth of Ezekiel. I do not have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die. Or do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God. And not that he should turn from his ways and leave. God wants us to leave. The reason why he adopts, he will, he predestined us to be adopted to be as his sons or to become his sons, it's so that we can live. He doesn't want us to die. He said, God does not have any pleasure in the death of a sinner. God doesn't take pleasure in that. His desire is that rather every sinner, every wicked person would turn from his wicked way and live. Now, wickedness doesn't mean you will take a gun and, sh you know, just shooting people, or you just hate people, or you just, you just do horrible things. Not that. It simply means you resist God. To be wicked is to resist God. To be wicked is to say no to God. It's as simple as that. So God does not desire that those who resist him 
should die in their sins. No, but rather they should stop resisting and receive. Receive so they can become sons and daughters and leave. That's why Christ came first. The second person of the Godhead, of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. He came first, so he opened the door so that we can live and not die if we turn from our wicked ways and stop resisting God and his work that he has done. Ezekiel 33 verse 11 says, Say to them, as I live, that's God speaking again, um, speaking to Ezekiel to tell the people of Israel and to all of us. He says, say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Why should you die? Why should we die? Oh man, why should you die? God does not take pleasure in it. It doesn't give him any pleasure. Right, the Bible says what? It says, precious are the death of the righteous in the sight of God. Rather, when the righteous died, God looks at it as a precious thing. But for the wicked, he has no pleasure in it. Hallelujah. And that's why when a Christian dies, in the true sense, if we really, really understand things, we don't have to cry, 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 as if we are hopeless, as if we don't know where the person is going. We need to rejoice rather, because he's going home, he's going to a better place. Yes, I know it's hard to understand, but that's what scripture says. He's going to the Father. If you, I went to American Embassy, and somebody was rejected, and he was crying like, like a, he was sobbing like a baby because they refused to give him American visa. Some got his, and you see them, oh, you see the excitement on their face with them and their wife and their children. They're all excited. Now, if you have a visa to go to the US and you are excited, if you move it on to eternity in God, what should you do? <laughs> we should rejoice. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's the truth. But, yeah, because of the emotional attachment and all those things, it's like we lose the person. Yeah, so, or sometimes when you look at the dead person, they remind you of your state. Oh, so I also become so, become like that one day, and that evoke some feelings in you. And then we begin to cry. Sometimes it's not for the dead person, for ourselves. Because, oh, so that will be my end also. That's why the Bible says it is much more better. It's better to be in a house of funeral than in a house of party where you can learn wisdom. In a house of funeral, you learn wisdom. That's what scripture says in Proverbs. Hallelujah. And so God does not desire, he does not take pleasure in the death of a sinner, of a wicked person. We want us to change so that we will be received as sons of God in Christ Jesus. Now, accepted in the beloved by the will of God. When you read verse 5 to 6 of uh, Ephesians 1, it says, According to the good pleasure of his will, that's 5b, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us acceptable in the beloved. It is in the beloved that we are made acceptable. It is only in Christ. And it's sad that today you have even Christians, some Christians, yeah, some Christians in Seoul, you know, in court.